Hello, hello, hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. Welcome, whatever time it is you're coming from, wherever you're coming from. Welcome to Red Hat Ansible Automates. My name is Damian Eversman, and I'm here today to talk to you about why automation, why Ansible. So, first of all, this is the abstract. I'm not going to spend a lot of time reading you what it says in the abstract. You can all read it yourself. You probably already have. Um, I just have it here so that when you download these slides later, you've got the information to help you remember what this presentation was supposed to be about. So first of all, let's start a little bit here to talk about what it is that we're going to cover today. First of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about who I am, let you know what my background is. Then we'll talk about what sorts of things can be automated. We'll talk about who can automate, and we'll talk about it from the point of view of an individual, of a team, and finally of the entire enterprise. And then finally, we'll wrap up with talking about growing your sphere of trust, which is a very important thing when it comes to enterprise automation. So as promised, here's a little bit about who I am. My name is Damian Eversman. Um, I've been in the IT industry coming up on three decades here pretty soon. Um, I am a developer by training. Um, I've also spent quite a bit of time as a development manager. I did spend some time in the data center as an operations person and a systems engineer. I spent very large portion of the time as an enterprise architect divine, designing applications and systems. And then finally, I'm now a Red Hat Solutions Architect. If you're not familiar with what that is, a Red Hat Solutions Architect is the geek on the team that travels around to different customers to help them understand what our products are, what they do, and how to get our products into the hands of the customers. There on the right-hand side, you can see all my digitals. Feel free to hit me up, drop me an email, connect with me on Twitter or LinkedIn, check out my website, or the few crumbs of things that I put out there on GitHub. So let's talk about who I really am for a minute. Right here in the uh, middle of the screen here is uh, Chicago, downtown Chicago. And that in fact is the Sears Tower there in the middle. Um, right next to the Sears Tower, that slightly gray building, that is the building that Red Hat's office is in and the one that I go to when I can uh, to hang out with other Red Hatters in the city. Um, I love living in Chicago. I love living by the lake. It's a wonderful place. Um, the picture to the upper left there is my family. You can see they're awfully excited that I'm a Red Hatter. They've actually taken a couple trips with me when I go to meetings. The one that you're looking at there, unfortunately, the reason they're excited is because while I spent three days in meetings, they spent three days at the parks in Orlando. And then finally there on the right is my dog, who thinks that she is a full-blown human member of the family. So let's jump right in. and Let's talk for a minute about what you can automate. The question very often is actually, what can't you automate? As you can see here, this is a non-complete list of everything that can be automated, right? Everything from cloud to virtualization, from Windows to Linux, networking, security, storage, monitoring applications, the entire DevOps lifecycle, you name it. There are literally hundreds of things that can be automated using Ansible. But that actually poses a problem. Let's take a minute and actually talk about human nature. So in uh, 2000, two psychologists from Columbia and Stanford universities actually performed an experiment. And they went to a grocery store and they set up a sample table like you see in lots of grocery stores today. One week they set out six jams and they let people try the jams and tried to sell jelly. The following week, they set up the same table, but this time they put out 24 jams. The one with 24 jams drew larger crowds and a lot more activity and interest. But in the end, it was the one with six jams that actually sold more over the course of its week. What can we learn from that? Well, we can learn that while large amounts of choice generate a lot of interest, it's smaller quantities that generate action. Choice, well, seemingly a desirable thing, often paralyzes people. This is where the term analysis paralysis comes from. The lesson here is to keep your options limited. Not limited because you're trying to force a decision. Keep them limited to a few really good choices. And that's where you really drive people to purchase or adopt or whatever it is that you're trying to get them to choose from. 
So let's talk about where this plays into things. We're going to talk about successful automation. And what happens is successful automation starts with the individual. Right? Then it grows to the team, and then it grows to the enterprise. But one of the things you need to keep in mind is projects launched without the buy-in of the individual are often doomed to fail. You'll hear things like, I didn't choose it, so I won't use it. So it's definitely something to keep in mind as you embark down your enterprise automation journey. You really want to start off with how does the individual benefit? So let's talk about automation for the individual. What exactly can the individual do with automation? Well, some good use cases for starting small and simple are things like environment variables, right? We can easily set Windows environment variables or Linux user profiles across entire swaths of systems in our uh, data center with just a single playbook. We can do things like user access management or editing a sudoers file across multiple systems. We can back up configurations across the network. We can back up network configurations. We can do storage. We can do a full system backup. We can back up applications configurations with ease and simplicity. And then finally, we can deploy really complicated applications to dozens or hundreds, or in some cases, thousands of systems from a single point of control. Finally, the two use cases that I hear people talking about a lot are more of this backup and restore, right? We can automate the running of both the backup and the validation of, of systems across an entire data center. We can maintain those backup profiles. We can push those configurations back out to multiple machines reliably and repeatably, and that's really important. We can restore server backups with the click of a button um, or schedule it to happen automatically to alleviate that configuration drift problem. We can build or rebuild machines from scratch in a dependable fashion. And we can turn our pets into cattle. So let's talk for a minute there about what that means. When you do backups, you really have a choice to recover, to restore. And, and what recovery means is restoring or regrouping. To return to the last known good state, recover from an accident. Well, I know when I've recovered from accidents in the past that I'm kind of weak and hobbling along for a while. And if the accident's bad enough, I might be hobbling along forever. Let's talk about rebuilding, though. Rebuilding means to build again to start fresh, to improve upon the original. For those of you as old as me or older, you might remember the $6 million man. We can rebuild him better, stronger, faster. If you had a choice between recovering to the original thing that failed or rebuilding from scratch better, stronger, faster, which would you choose? Very often, we've chosen recover because it's the simpler or the easier path. But with something like Ansible Automation, rebuilding becomes just as easy and just as fast. The difference here, the distinction here, is really the distinction that we hear a lot about pets versus cattle, right? Pets are lovely and wonderful, and it's great to have them in the home. But when it comes to servers, we really don't want pets. We don't want that server that we couldn't stand to lose. We want cattle, we want livestock, we want expendable machines that are easy to replace. And that's what the recover versus the rebuild question is about. And automation really helps us lean into that rebuild side of things. So let's take the next step. Let's talk about automation for teams. So a little bit of statistic really quick for you. We're about halfway into the retiring of the baby boomer generation. It started about 10 years ago, 2011 officially, when the first baby boomer turned 65. And we have about 10 years left of it. The number of baby boomers that are going to reach the retirement age will peak in just the next few years. Over the next 10 years, we can expect an average, a daily average of 10,000 baby boomers to reach retirement age. 
How many of those people are on your staff? How many of those people are the heroes on your staff that have the, the knowledge that no one else has? They're the ones that answer the phone at 3 a.m. when everything goes down. Let's talk about what's important about that. But one thing to keep in mind here is, in addition to this aging workforce, our recent pandemic, COVID-19, created a significant bump in retirements, early retirements in 2020, and it's expected to continue into 2021 and beyond. So that workforce, that aging workforce, the silver tsunami, if you will, is actually going to come to roost pretty soon. So let's talk a little bit about not hero busting, but bat phone busting. So the hero is the person on your team who knows how to do the important things, who can nurse that system that fails every now and then back to health whenever it happens. But the problem is no one really wants to be the guy or gal that always gets the call at 3 a.m. because they're the only hero. Besides, what happens when your hero retires or wins the lottery? I don't like to use the, the bus analogy. Let's say they win the lottery. What automation seeks to do is not hero busting, though. It's bat phone busting. I don't want to have to call that one person. I don't want to have to call Batman every single time something goes wrong. I want to enable heroes to flourish. I want to enable heroes to build automation that can do that special thing that they do. I want to enable everyone to be a hero. So what does it take to do that? Well, teaming, right? It getting by with a little help from our friends. Ansible uses a self-documenting style of, of coding, right? It's called YAML. It's English language, key value pairs, lists. It's very easy to read and understand. And this, this self-documenting style of Ansible playbooks really enables that knowledge sharing and it enables the capture of that institutional knowledge that those aging, soon to retire workers in your workforce have. The ease with which these playbooks can be authored leads to uh, coding conventions and style guidelines, which is more collaboration among your team. It gives them the ability to work together hand in hand to build out this automation. And then finally, the common language of automation fosters code reuse and code review. and It fosters that collaborative working together. Ansible is built for collaboration and teaming, from the human-readable plain text playbook all the way to the use of source code management systems to store the playbooks. The idea is to foster that collaboration and teaming that we value so much in our teams. So what are some of the use cases that teams can use to really take the benefits of automation? Well, we can uh, help alleviate the problems in update and patching life cycles, right? That's an entire team's job. And lately, those sorts of things have turned into long evening hours or long weekends even to get all of the patches and updates in place. Let's get back to the days of Patch Tuesday and make it easy. System deployments are, are something that takes a lot of time and involves a team, but we can actually stand up bare metal, virtualized, or cloud instances easy and reliably using Ansible automation. Security and compliance is a huge one. I mean, if you think about a security profile or a compliance checklist, like they're all checklists. What is a playbook, but really a checklist? Setting X goes to setting A, Setting Y is set to B. I mean, it's easy to really write those compliance checklists and security profiles as Ansible playbooks. And then you can run them against as many machines as you want on a weekly or daily or even hourly basis to maintain that secure, non-drifting configuration. Finally, you can automate your automation. Um, if you're really invested in shell scripts or Perl or some other automation tool, well, let Ansible schedule those jobs. Let Ansible manage those executions and, and integrate them into more complex workflows. This is actually what we call orchestration. It's 
taking that automation of tasks, which is already so great, removing that repetitive toil off of the shoulders of your workers and enabling them to improve and iterate faster and takes it to the next level. Automating your automation is when something magical happens. This is when we're gonna move into automation for the enterprise. So now you've got your servers team, your cloud team, your networking team, containers, applications, storage, everybody's automated now, right? Every team has the tools that they need to automate. But there's still a problem. You're not quite done yet. Automated silos are still silos. And silos are what we're trying to get away from. Silos are what keeps us from making those huge advancements that come with enterprise automation. So let's talk about enterprise automation. Now, I like to use the analogy that enterprise automation is like automotion, right? It's like self-driving smart cars, except it's like a world where all of the cars are self-driving smart cars that talk to each other. It's, it's all of the fun of driving and none of the work, really. It, it keeps the eyes on the road for you and the hands on the wheel, and, but it makes sure that everybody does what they're supposed to do, when they're supposed to do it, where they're supposed to do it, keeping them in their own lanes and at the safe speeds. Enterprise automation actually takes one of its biggest cues from one of the most significant leaps in the automotive industry from a little over a century ago, the assembly line. Of course, the automotive industry stole that earlier idea from the Chicago meatpacking industry from the 1860s, though for them it was more of a, a disassembly line. Anyway, regardless of that, let's go through an exercise where we talk about the adoption of enterprise automation. So what you see in front of you is a typical IT process, right? We are taking an application, deploying its server and the infrastructure needed to run it, and setting it to live. Now, there's a whole bunch of steps. I've put a few of them up here. In your organization, there may be more or less. They might be different. But this is sort of a representative selection. We need to provision and secure that virtual machine and the operating system on it. We need to allocate and attach storage and a network. We need to deploy and secure the application itself. And then finally, we need to launch it and make it live. Each of these processes is done potentially by a different separate team. And each of them takes a certain amount of time for an individual on that team to do. Some of them might take an hour, some of them might take two, some of them might take a half an hour. I've kind of just thrown up a smattering of times here. About an hour for most of the tasks, maybe a half an hour for launching the application. Because these are all done by different teams, we also have task switching or mode switching. This happens in the handoff phase, right? Where after the machine is provisioned, it needs to be handed over to the security team to secure it, right? now. Because all of these people are on different teams and different offices or working from home, it might take a while for one person to pick something up after it moves out of another person's queue. In some cases, it might take until after the weekend or until someone gets back from vacation. In some cases, it could happen right away. Again, I've just come up with an average of not until the next day, eight hours. So if we just use these rough averages, Total processing time where it's actually in human hands is six and a half hours. It's not too bad. The total standby time though is 48 hours. That means my end user, who doesn't see all of these little idiosyncrasies in the process, sees a 54 and a half hour delay. That's almost a week and a half to do this process that most teams do on a regular basis. So let's, let's introduce a small change. Let's introduce an easy change. Let's enable the individuals or the teams and give them their automation tools. It's a small change, but now we're using automation in our provisioning and security and storage allocation and configuring. What we see now is that each of the individuals performing those tasks gets it done in minutes instead of an hour. Right? In some cases, it's down as low as five minutes to flip the switch to get that application live. The total time it's in human hands now 
is an hour and 20 minutes. That's awesome. Each of those individuals now has more time on their hands to either get more done or to research improving processes. But the problem is the teams still need to hand it off to the next person. We still have that handoff time. That standby time is still sitting at 48 hours. As far as the consumer that's waiting for the application to be deployed is concerned, it's still taking almost 50 hours for that simple request to be completed. So now let's bring in enterprise automation. Let's bring in that assembly line. Let's build a workflow that takes that automation that each person has developed, each team has developed, and chains it together so that it automatically flows from one to the next. We still have that hour and 20 minute processing time where each person has only had 15 or 10 minutes of, of actual processing time to get their task completed. But what happens now is it automatically moves from one piece of automation to the next. I've put five minutes here in practice, it's probably less than five minutes. It's probably almost instantaneous, but we'll allow for a small delay. We'll call it five minutes. Our total standby time is now just half an hour. We've taken the time for this entire task to complete from almost a week and a half down to less than two hours. This is an amazing achievement. This is something that everybody can do very easily with enterprise automation. And it starts with enabling the individual. Each individual is able to automate their specific tasks. Each team is able to build automation. And then with enterprise automation, with workflows, we can take and chain those together and have them happen automatically. So let's talk about enabling the masses. Let's talk about Ansible Tower. What is Ansible Tower? Ansible Tower is a core component of the Ansible automation platform. It is both a UI and a RESTful API, and it allows you to take all of those pieces of automation that your teams have developed and scale them out across the entire enterprise. It provides you with role-based access control. It provides you with push-button access. It provides you with central logging for everything so that you know who did what, when, and what happened. And finally, it provides you with those powerful workflows that can help you match those processes and make them happen seamlessly. But there's one more step that comes. There's one more thing that can make this sweeten the deal even more. And that's event-driven automation. That's where you take a, a ticketing tool like ServiceNow or monitoring tools like QRadar or Splunk and you actually figure out certain things that you already know how to automate. And when those requests come in or when those issues pop up, you have them automatically feed into Ansible Tower. That means that in many cases, things are done before anybody even needs to be notified. The first notification is issue found and fixed. What could be more awesome than that? Finally, Ansible Automation Platform includes several SaaS features that really sweeten the deal more. Ansible Content Collections are ways of packaging custom modules, custom plugins, uh, Ansible roles, and, and indeed just whole playbooks together in ways that can be distributed, managed, shared around with different parts of your organization. And then Automation Hub gives you the ability to not only leverage those your own across different parts of your organization, but also to be able to access other certified curated content collections from around the globe, from many of our partners and from Red Hat itself. There's also an automation analytics piece that integrates Red Hat insights into Ansible Automation Platform to give you insight into your automation efficiencies that can be found and had within your uh, Ansible Automation Platform deployment. And then finally, the Automation Services Catalog, which is a place that developers and business users can get quicker access to their automation resources across all of their environments. When I started this talk, one of the things that I talked about was how the individual was at the core. First, you have to gain the trust of the individual in this automation tool, in this automation process. And once you have individuals across your organization, 
that have really grown to trust and indeed to use the automation you can start to foster teams that build trusted automation workflows initially for themselves, but then begin to enable those for others. And when those get chained together in bigger processes and workflows across all of the entire organization, your enterprise benefits from the trusted platform of enterprise automation. You know, this, this growth of spheres of trust is actually not all that different from human evolution itself, right? We started off as family units roving across the savanna, hunting and gathering. Eventually, we started to group together in tribes or teams where we'd share different resources and knowledge among those tribes and teams and started to trust other family individuals. And then finally, we grouped together into even larger civilizations where we've come to blindly trust some of the tools because we share common choices, common decisions, common reasoning. Successful enterprise automation is about growing those spheres of trust, which is human nature. Evolve your IT. Thank you very much. I've been Damien Eversman. And uh, I think we'll go ahead and move into a Q&A section right now.